and to function well. So as a social worker, I'm guided by six core values. And those core values help me to engage both the practice part, which I had did for 35 years as a practitioner, but the other as a social work educator and helping students to see the responsibility toward the larger society. So those core values are service, social justice, dignity and worth of the person, the importance of human relationships, integrity and competence. Social justice relates to social work's purpose of improving the social conditions that impact or impede social functioning. Now, in its simplest form, social justice deals with promoting a just society by challenging injustice and value diversity. When I think about our society, I think about those structural issues that impact people through no fault of their own. And so one of the conditions that I look at, try to understand, is that social justice should reflect that people are not discriminated against, nor their welfare and their well-being constrained or prejudice that limit their basic opportunity on all the issues of diversity, gender, sexual orientation, social class, or their background, or their ability to function in terms of disabilities or various abilities. So one of the things that I think about is how are resources distributed in this country? And the distribution of resources in this country is based on advantages and disadvantages, and how individuals in this society receive them. So when I looked at this particular topic, what are advantages? Well, advantages under social justice model includes money, it includes basic housing, jobs, education, medical care, child care, when we look at our elderly, are they cared for in a way that allows them to thrive and grow? We look at personal security. How does housing impact urban, rural, and suburban communities? What is availability of transportation, both for recreation and employment? And then what is the opportunities that are extended to the citizens. And so whether we want to think about the unjust and just ways in which those resources are distributed, that gives rise to the disparities that emerge. And there's two categories I'd like to share with you that I believe social injustice emerge. One is treatment with people based on their demographics. And we know most of the isms, racism, sexism, ageism, and heterosexism. Those are just but a few. But in those categories emerges social injustice. The other has to deal with the government, unequal government regulation involves laws that purposely or otherwise discriminate against a group from the same opportunities and resources based on differences that are unique to the group. So you think about same-sex marriage. It's taken us a long time to come to the realization to say that people can love and marry who they want. But all the course of that time, those individuals struggled. And so now we're at a point in our society where we still struggle with it. But that is a part when you look at the unequal government regulations. So what are the other kinds of unequal government regulations that impact the citizenry? So one is poverty. We have been fighting the war on poverty since the 1960s. We've had all kinds of programs 
to help young people get into college. We've had housing programs, we've had income maintenance programs, and yet we still find poverty as a key issue that the United States faces. The death penalty, we struggle with that. We look at the disproportionality of people of color incarcerated. What are the environmental rights? I lived in Homewood and I happened to see a group of young people who were placing devices on the light poles and I asked myself, what are you doing? They said, we're trying to measure the air quality in this community. We're trying to see if in fact it impacts asthma for kids. And so we talk about environmental rights. In some communities, every other lot is filled with inoperative kinds of experiences kids can use because they're weeds. In some communities, you see no barren houses, no broken houses down. People have access to grass and leisure time activities. And so the environmental rights is important. We saw it in Flint with the water. The other is access to health care. We in this country are still trying to struggle with universal health care, and we've had come a long way with the Affordable Care Act, or as people commonly refer to it, Obamacare. We've come a long way, but we have not reached the level at which our citizens are healthier as a result of it. We talk about labor laws. And we've seen over the last several years an attempt to break the unions that have helped in many ways raise the income of people, and yet we still struggle with whether they're viable to help us. We look at civil rights, and in our civil rights, we've come a long way, but we often hear about the laws, police will protect and serve, and the violations that are accompanying many of our citizens. And finally, which is, in, I think, most significant, is access to education. Education has always been considered the great equalizer, that if you went and you did what you were supposed to do, you graduated high school, you went to college, that it would be OK. But that's not right for everyone. They follow the process, but they do not reap the same rewards. There are four areas in which I'd like to share with you the impact of one of our greatest travesties, and that's income inequality. In this country, poverty impacts disparities in education, disparities in health, and an example that I'll use is the infant mortality rates in this country. The other is disparity in food security. We often see on TV so many advertisements asking for us to donate money to food for people who are unable to have access to food in this country, in which we consider ourselves to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We still have kids to go to bed who are unable to eat, their families unable to provide for them. Mm -hmm. And finally, what has predominated most of the news is disparity in the criminal justice system and those impact. And as a result of that, we see Black Lives Matter as a social movement, looking at the disparities that result in poor and minority people's interface with the police department. I'd just like to give you a backdrop about American inequality in terms of wealth. In this country, the 30, 30 richest Americans own as much as half of the U.S. population. So we have this small percentage of people where wealth is concentrated. 85 individuals own as much as half of the world in terms of wealth. The United States has 5% of the world's population, and yet we have 30% of its wealth. And yet we have young people who go hungry. We have people who are homeless. When you think about the United States and the world, China, India, and Africa combined 
comprise about half the world's population, but they have 12% of its wealth. Those 30 individuals that I mentioned own $792 billion, while the bottom half of Americans own 1.1% of the country's wealth, which is also $792 billion, but it's 150 million people. So you think about why we have some of these disparities when we have this high concentration of wealth. What you learn is that there is a process called opportunity captured so that the dependents and the descendants of people with wealth only get wealthier. They go to the best schools, they're able to afford the better health care. They're able to participate in life at a different level than those individuals who do not have access to that kind of wealth. When I look at equality of opportunity, sometimes it looks like people are getting ahead based on their own abilities, when in fact, much of what occurs is that the rules that they play by are biased in their favor. The other is opportunity hoarding. If these wealth is not distributed, then the disparities that exist continue because there is no targeted input to reduce them. We are able to use terms that help divide us. And I'd like to think about and have you think about two. One is race and one is ethnicity. Race is ascribed and it's being used to identify people who have a shared genetic or biological or physical features. Whereas we say there's a white race a black race, Asian race. Well, in fact, there's only one, and it's the human race. And we have socially constructed race as a way in which to divide people based on resources and location. So Maya Angelou has often said we are more alike than we are different. It is our ethnicity that makes us different. That is our common history amongst ethnic groups, their national origin, or even their language and their culture. So we are all one human race with many ethnicities that comprise us as a people. And so if we use the social construction of terms and concept, they continue to divide us. They continue to provide the elites with ways to keep the other more numerical numbers in check. So I, I tell my students, if all the people who made 30,000 or less voted in one way, could we elect someone who would intervene? Well, the answer would be yes, because numerically there are more people in this country of lower income status than there are of higher. But the division amongst us is created and nurtured through many of the kinds of concepts that we talk about. So we talk about a low class, a middle class, an upper class. And people want to hold on to those categories because it provides some sense of comfort to them. Well, the disparities that I look at cross many of those barriers. And so when I look at disparities, and when I talk about disparities, I want you to think about how disparities denote an unjust and unfair system. All children are required to go to school at age five. And at age 16, they can leave. But the goal is, is that they will be graduated. That's the goal. But we have a system that each state is responsible for its own education system. So in Pennsylvania, 
Local school districts are funded by real estate taxes. And herein lies the problem in terms of access to educational opportunities. And I'll give the example most closest to us. Districts that have high socioeconomic tax base, Mill Creek, spend more per capita on their students than districts with low socioeconomic tax base. The Erie School District, and I'm sure you've each heard that the school district is in financial trouble and their resolution is to cut all sports, arts, and music to meet the deficit that has resulted from the budget shortfall. We know, research says that those are three areas that help young people academically. When we look at educational disparities aside from the physical environment, those disparities are often based on treatment of ethnic and minority students within the educational system. As Andrew said, I am the field coordinator for the social work program. And so I place students in the area school districts. And my social work students oftentimes are teamed with student teachers from various schools. And so in this particular instance, at Piper Burley, a young man, he was in the fifth grade, and he was having some behavioral problems. And my student was working with him. And the student teacher told my social work student, oh, don't worry. In a few year, years, he'll be in an orange jumpsuit. So that she had already given up on him. And I asked the student, I said, well, what did you say? And in disbelief, she said, I didn't know what to say. She said, I, I couldn't believe that she thought that of him. And so the incidents that we talked about, teacher bias, that can occur. And even though we try to provide exposure there are implicit and explicit materials on the social media, on T books. And the books weren't the same books that I had in school. So when I returned to high school, I asked my teacher, I said, why do they have different books than what I have? And, and she said, oh no, that couldn't be. I said, yes. And I then told her that when I opened the book up, the book was two years advanced from the grade book that I had in school. So already, they were being exposed to materials that I was not. Fast forward 30 years, and I have kids in high school at Westinghouse. My daughter goes to visit, same program, and she comes back and she says, "How?" Can